In this video, we're going to be looking at the find shortest path node. We're going to be looking at how we can create simple curve-based inputs to the find shortest path so that we can generate interesting paths across a height field. We're also going to be exploring how we can measure different properties of the height field, such as slope angle, uh, ascent cost, or descending costs, and have those influence the pathing of the find shortest path node. All right, so, We've already created our height field node, and I'm just going to begin with not care too much about the features of the terrain. We're just gonna apply some noise to it, which is pretty typical practice. And then what we're going to do is immediately, I'm just gonna click on the curve node and I hit two on the keyboard to switch to the orthographic view top down. And I'm just gonna left click at one end of the landscape and left click at another end and hit enter to complete my curve. And we've sort of specified already sort of a start and the end of our, of our curve. And it is important uh, that we bear in mind that this is the first point that we clicked on and this is the second point. So we have a kind of direction to that curve there, which we can actually visualize. If we look at the point numbers, you can see that we have our points zero and one. So zero is the starting point, one is the end point. All right, so if we wire the height field noise into the find shortest path node and we wire the curve into the second input, we're not going to get an output because if we look on the warning sign here, we can see that the find shortest path node is saying that no start points have been specified. That's not it. That's not the only issue here, but let's go and remedy that straight away. We'll click on the find shortest path and we're just gonna set the start point to be zero and the end point to be one on the curve. And we're still gonna see that, okay, we get something that shows up now, um, but it's actually just a single point uh, kind of at the origin of the world. And we're not getting any error, but the problem here is that we're trying to path across a terrain and uh, we can't path off, uh, across the terrain, we need to path across a mesh. So we could just use the convert height field node. Let's go ahead, turn that into geometry. So we can see we now have edges on the height field. And if we go to the find shortest path node, we can now see that we are getting some pathing across the terrain. And we can say keep original geometry on the find shortest path node, and we can now see what it looks like to have that path going across the terrain. And already we're getting something kind of interesting, um, but it, it's still pretty basic, still pretty naive. So let's see what we can do to take this a little bit further. Uh, the first issue that we can see is, at least in, in my perspective, an issue that we can see is that we get these obvious kind of stepping uh, artifacts across the terrain because we're currently pathing across a grid. So what we may want to do instead is just remesh our height field and before I actually visualize the remesh, or if you've wired it in immediately there, you may end up waiting for it to cook for a while. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna set the meshing mode to be adaptive. I'm gonna set the relative density to be one. And now if we look at the remesh, we're gonna see that it cooks for a minute. And we end up with a triangulated terrain mesh. And we can wire that in to the find shortest path. and we now get a new path across the terrain, which feels quite a lot more organic uh, because we're not seeing those lots of right angles. We don't tend to find right angles uh, in nature uh, or in man-made paths. Okay, so now let's have a little look at the Find Shortest Path node and the options that it gives us, as well as the output attributes. So I'm gonna disable Keep Original Geometry, and immediately we can see, apart from the start and the end point that we set, we have a bunch of parameters. So let's have a look at the ones that are already activated before we start diving into the grayed out ones. We can see that we're getting uh, this, this sort of toggled on output paths. It gives us a drop down menu and it gives us some choices about what kind of pathing that we want to be doing. And it's saying from each start to any end at the moment. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if we have a, a number of start points and a number of end points, which we can specify potentially with groups, uh, it's going to path from every single start to a random end. So we can visualize what that looks like. If we disconnect our initial curve and we scatter onto the remesh, a thousand points is quite a lot. So let's just go with 10. And we can see right now that we're still only getting one path, but what happens, and that's because we've only specified zero and one as being the start and end points. So what we can do instead is we can now create a group, which we can, of, of points, here we go. So on the scatter node, we're creating a group of points called start. It's gonna grab everything. You can see that it's doing that because all of these points are actually being highlighted gold, although that might be a little bit difficult to see. And then let's do a second scatter. 
Uh, I'm going to change the seed so we get a different distribution of points. So there we go. I'm just visualizing the terrain. So we can see we've got our endpoints, which was probably a little bit difficult to see. And we've got our start points. So let's just create a new group called end. And we can explore the functionality of how the functionality changes according to that menu selection that we've made. So if we have a look at the find shortest path, we can see that we also need to override these groups with our groups that we've created called start and end points. And there we go. Looks like these menus are broken at the moment, but just writing it in there works fine. So, okay, we can see that indeed we have got our every, for every single start, we're parving to a random end, but not all of the ends are being used. So we can see that this end over here is currently not being used. And you know what, to make this a little bit easier to see, I'm gonna to go to the point marker size and I'm just gonna increase that up. There we go, seven to make these points a little bit easier. So now we can see what's going on a bit better. Okay, so the reason that we're not seeing paths to and from every single point is because we're saying from each start to any end. We can change this from any start to uh, any end, and it looks like it's completely failed to find any paths there, interestingly enough. And, and if we go from any start to each end, then we're going to see that uh, we are getting, uh, yeah, every end is getting path to, but not every start is being path from. And then from each start to each end, this one is going to start to look a little bit complicated because uh, it's going to draw a point between everything. And this can be kind of nice uh, if, you've ever, if you want to very quickly create kind of complex network. Um, right now we're seeing that they're basically straight lines between points because we don't have any costs on our terrain to, to traversing up slopes and so forth. But uh, this can be a nice way to sort of like, if you want to quickly decorate a terrain with sort of maybe animal trails or something like that, um, you can just generate sort of a bunch of points and path between all of them. But this isn't the way that we want to work. We want to set up a kind of general purpose tool that, as we did previously, allows us to draw a curve. Um, problem for us is that uh, it, if I just switch back to, um, yeah, zero and one, there we go. But the problem for us, if I just move that, let's just tidy this up. So I'm just going to cut this all out, place it over here, hold Y and slice those wires. Um, but yeah, no, but the problem for us is right now, we're routing between point zero and one. Um, and if I move these points with the middle mouse button, so I remember I, you hit enter to go into the curve editing mode. So I hit enter on, when, with the curve selected and then start dragging this around. We can see that I can find new paths uh, between these, these, these points. But if I was to then left click on this point and click somewhere else, we're gonna see that we don't actually end up extending the curve all the way to the end. And that's the kind of pathing that we want to set up. We want to set up uh, a find trans path node that can just handle sort of generic curve inputs and do the pathing for us. Okay, so let's go back to the find shortest path and let's put the uh, out original geometry output on again so we can see what we're looking at. And we'll come back to this output paths and the start and end points and explore how we can generate a curve of any length later. Um, so let's have a look at this. We're looking at the output tab. So everything so far is related to the actual geometry that's being output or created, but these all of these uh, toggles and names here are just attributes that have been created. So if I right click on the uh, find shortest path node and open the geometry spreadsheet, we can see that indeed we are getting that cost attribute and we're getting that uh, original origin point attribute. Uh, okay, uh, so this is telling us surface geometry point that corresponds with the output point. That's interesting. Um, I'm not sure that is true. It's <laughs> truly what it's doing. Turn off keep original geometry. Oh, there we go. It is It is what it's doing. It's because I had the keep original geometry on. It was confusing things. So yeah, this just tells us which point on the surface was, uh, the, was it rooting through, uh, which might be useful for a bunch of purposes, but we don't care about. Okay. So just to visualize the cost a little bit more easily, let's use, uh, make sure we've got labs toolkit installed. I'm sure you probably have already. Let's go labs attribute normalize float and we'll go and normalize that cost and visualize the output. And we can now see that uh, we have the sort of start of the curve is in the blue. That means that not much distance has been traveled. So there's not much path cost yet. And when we get towards the end, uh, it turns towards red saying that the greatest distance has been traveled. 
And this is basically the backbone of the find shortest path node. Uh, it's going to, under the hood, measure tons of potential options for getting to where it's trying to go from the, st from the start to the end, the different various routes it can take. And it's going to pick the route that generates the overall lowest cost. Of course, because it's searching for lots of potential paths, the find shortest path node can get quite slow as it scales with the complexity of the geometry that you're running the pathfinding on, as well as the number of paths that are trying to be uh, determined. Okay, so then let's have a look at the next tab, the path costs. Uh, the path costs tab, uh, we see that we have a bunch of options relating to uh, the costing, like how, how do we actually determine the cost of the route? Uh, if we turn on max search path cost, we're gonna see that we don't get any path because it's discarded the paths that have the cost over 10 as we increase this to a higher number because the overall path falls within this limit, it's gonna keep generating it. We also have the ability to specify a custom per point cost attribute, and we are going to be making use of this uh, approach. Uh, other than that, we have primitive cost attribute, which is also another way you can do it. Uh, we have emit distance from costs. So if we do that, you're gonna see we get a very strange looking uh, path. Um, not, it's just pretty much random, I think. It's just chosen one of the random, uh, a completely random path across the train. We can see that yeah, if we go and have a look at the cost, the cost of start to end just uniformly costs 0 0.5. So there is no logic here, um, as far as I can tell. <laughs> uh, we can also consider turning costs. Uh, and if we omit the distance from costs, we do still get a cost now because it's trying to take the path that involves the least turning. Um, at least that's what it says it does on the tin, but uh, I don't tend to reuse this. Maybe it makes sense um, in some cases, but I haven't found a case for it yet. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna ignore the angular cost attribute, the custom edge cost, and the override heuristic. Um, for now, um, although these have each have their specific use cases, we're going to focus solely on the point cost attribute. So I'm going to make sure that the cost attribute that it's looking for that determines the cost of the point is called cost. And now it's going to complain that we don't have a point cost attribute. So uh, we need to set one up and we could just go attribute create and we could create a attribute that's of type float called cost and give it a default or uniform value uh, of one. And you're going to see, get some slight differences as we change that. But this just means that basically we've we've reset up the distance cost. So uh, by just giving every point a value of one, uh, we're essentially creating something akin to what is the distance that's being traveled. Not quite, but close to it. Okay, so that's not what we're going to do. Um, we could also um, use the measure node to, or in fact, let's go with the measure curvature, labs measure curvature. And we can see that we get, uh, by default, a convexity and concavity attribute, uh, which are visualized using different colors. Um, so let's have a look at what other versions we've got. I want something that creates like a bigger, broader mask. I quite like that shape operator on the terrain there. And what's interesting about this is that we now get sort of red regions on the outcrops and green regions in the kind of occluded areas. So let's just say that the convexity attribute is now the cost attribute and have a look at the output and make sure that we're continuing to visualize the terrain but without color because it's a little confusing. So we can see now that the diff we get a, a different result uh, if we just turn off the coin, if we keep distance and we turn off the point cost attribute. So this is just the distance alone. And then this is with the cost attribute. And if we turn off the distance, we start to see something. Um, I think we actually want to consider distance as well as the cost, um, but this means that we will need to um, we'll need to scale the cost attribute somehow to make sure that it's overpowering the distance because right now we're not seeing much difference there. So right before we go into the find shortest path node, let's use the attribute uh, adjust float. We want to adjust the cost and let's just multiply by a factor of 10 or even 100. There we go. Um, so now if we turn off that cost, we're gonna see that we get a different result. And if we visualize the color, we can see, in fact, let's keep both of these output and let's raise, mm, how are we gonna do this? Let's merge this. Okay, I'm just trying to make a nice preview here. So let's merge the terrain with its color and let's offset the output wire by a value of one. In the, so now we can see both of these. 
And we can see that actually as we're parthing now and we turn, and by the way, it's very easy to get confused. We, we don't care about the output cost attribute. We only care about the path costs tab, cost attribute point cost. So you can see this is basically just measuring the distance and trying to find the shortest distance between the two points um, by default, the def default behavior. And then if we turn on our point cost, we can see that it's avoiding the red regions um, as it's trying to find its pathing. Uh, it's kind of somehow managed to sneak through a very small, uh, small gap there. Uh, you can see that the cost is slightly lower. So this is where the, the if we increase the weight, actually, if this cost, it's going to try harder to avoid that region. So you can see, indeed, it does. Uh, it's sort of trying to balance those two properties. Okay, so that's kind of the fundamentals. Um, and actually, just to, just to sort of play around with it, let's, let's try and uh, revert that back to convexity. And this time, let's use concavity. You can see this time, it's now going to be actively seeking out those red regions uh, to traverse across. Uh, so it's quite quite interesting. Um, and already we can see that we can create something that feels like it might have been created by sort of man uh, sort of navigating across the terrain, um, sort of like, you know, a highland path or something to that effect. Uh, so that's really the fundamentals of the pathfinding, um, how you assign a cost attribute, and uh, yeah, when you're trying to navigate between a start and an endpoint that's been predefined.